morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's Howard Elliott. I'm a project engineering manager working on the Great West uh, mainline electrification. And I'm joined by my colleague, Martin Veal, who's a very important track project engineer who's done some great things with us. Uh, today, we're going to talk to you about different elements of Great Western electrification or the modernization. I'm going to talk a little bit about the new rolling stock coming in and some optioneering lessons that we've learnt where John talks about or talked about his pains in the Northwest. We've taken those as lessons and developed them further. And then Martin's going to talk about some great work we did last summer. It is project experiences such as these and others that are being showcased today that sort of clearly demonstrate why Network Rail is now working in environments uh, uh, geographically diverse as Australia, New Zealand, Dubai, we're now working in North America and it's institutions like the PWI that creates people that enables all of us to work internationally and not just that future in the UK that David was talking about. So I think we should be fabulously proud of all these projects we're actually seeing today. To talk about Great Western though, it is a challenging project. Though those of you that work on it will know that. Uh, Martin and I know it more than most. Primarily, we're delivering electrification from Maidenhead to Swansea. That's a thousand single track kilometres of electrification. We're introducing four new rolling stocks onto the region as well. We've got the Crossrail rolling stock going to Reading. We've got the new Super Express train or the IEP, which I'll talk about in a minute. We're introducing new DMUs or cascaded DMUs. We're introducing cascaded EMUs. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Our Commander-in-Chief, Mark Kahn, has referred to this project as open heart surgery. And I assure you, it does feel like it at times. But what we have to understand is, why are we doing it? And that's a really important starting block for all of us, so we understand what our end goal is. It really starts back with this train set, the Intercity 125, the Class 43 Loco. The youngest is now over 29 years old. I think there's been some refurbishments, some have been just sort of upholstered, some have been refurbished with electrics, but these are getting life expired for this intercity route. So in 2009, the government made a business-led decision and, and announced Agility Trains as the preferred bidder to replace these train sets. It's all very great, it's all very much paperwork, it had been in the newspaper, but it's not very tangible. However, it did become very tangible for us in October of last year, when the first Class 800 from Japan arrived at the, Northwest, uh, the at North Pole Depot near London. In the future, they won't be manufactured in Japan. They'll be manufactured in Newton Aycliffe, which is very good for uh, UK PLC. And there's going to be three different types of stock. There's going to be fully electric, there's going to be diesel, and there's going to be bi-modes. But the IEP isn't going to run just on the electrified areas. It's a big area that's going to run. It's going to run all the way down to Penzance. It's going to go beyond Swansea as well. It goes north of where we're actually electrifying as well. So there's a lot of work to be done around gauge clearance for that and also uh, bridge dynamics. So we're actually in the process of gauge clearing or have gauge cleared for most of this route now up to where the test trains will run and over the next couple of years we'll extend that gauge clearance over the full route. We've also analysed 6,000 underbridges uh, for bridge resonance problems. That's, that's a big work bank in itself, looking at 6,000 bridges. But we've only had to re do remedial works to one bridge, which coincided on the Great Western Electrification route, so we deliver that piece of the project as well. But we have an electrified rolling stock, so we actually have to get electrically clear for that pantograph and the wires beneath all our overbridges. Between Maidenhead and Swansea, there are 293 overbridges. That's quite a lot. We've looked at all of them through early grip stages, etc. <coughs> Excuse me. We've identified that 123 of those need to be either reconstructed, jacked, or just demolished and removed uh, as they are from the asset completely. Also, we've identified, as well as those, we've got 33 track lowers. So you get some sort of sense of scale of the volumes of work we're generating over in the western region. But that's a lot of optioneering. 
And it was really interesting seeing John's photo in 2009. There was about nine people there in a building called New King's Beam House in London. And I joined in that same building in 2011. And I think the team was twice the size. So if you look at all these projects that team were looking at, they were looking at Midland Main Line, they were looking at Northwest Electrification, they were looking at Great West Main Line, Gospel Oak to Barking, did I mention? Oh, Valley Lines, that's the other one. They also asked us to look at DC to AC conversion in the southeast. So that small group of people were looking at a lot of infrastructure changes. So when I look back and I go, did we do a good job of optioneering? No, we didn't. But you look at the numbers of people that were actually looking at it, we weren't manned up for it. But what we've done is we've learned through this, and this is what I want to talk about a bit. One of those great learnings on this journey, and John's pain in the Northwest was a learning for us on the Great Western, was how to quantify safety and make it as objective as possible. We have lots of diagrams and we have lots of principles and standards, but what makes the right choice? And this has been necessary due to this changed legislative environment. John talked about, we didn't have TSIs, we didn't have the common safety method, the UK regulation is actually about the Electricity Work Act has actually been harmonious through all this duration. But as TSIs and CSM have been introduced, industry standards have changed and company standards have changed. This is a very flexible environment and it's actually quite difficult for us. We're, we're almost constantly chasing our tail with change to make sure we're doing the right thing. The common safety method has probably been our greatest influence through our optioneering. We need to demonstrate through a clear justification why we've chosen this safe option because there are many options and each of them will have different safety elements to them. So what CSM is, and I'm sure all of you are aware of this now because it's quite common amongst our, our language, is we need to understand the hazards and then manage the risks. The hazards are very few actually for an overline structure. You've got flashovers to the bridge, to the trespasser, uh, and then there's looking at wire heights and stations, which John talked about. And then there's flash over to the person, the bloke with the umbrella or the selfie stick. So the, the hazards are quite easy to identify. But it's actually what design considerations can be made that manage that risk, that mitigate that hazard. So the design options come down to the likelihoods and the severities. And what we've done then is we've, we've, we've quantified and given ourselves tables that we can score based on different choices that we may make. So static electrical clearance, we saw some numbers up on there earlier. We will rate something. Um, the greater the clearance, the, the safer it is, etc. But then we also look actually at the location. So there's a public and there's also a staff environment. So from a staff, a, a railway maintenance point of view, if there's some points close to the bridge or there's a GSMR cabin, GSMR mast or some signalling lokes adjacent, we're going to put our teams closer to that structure which may be bringing the wire height down. The likelihoods are increasing. From a public point of view, we can look at a map and go, well actually there's some schools nearby or it might just be an accommodation bridge that takes a tractor and some cows twice a year. So what we've done is we've brought all this and able to score it. We then cross-reference that with the likelihoods events from the RSSB um, national data on actually events that have happened, where they've happened, the environments they've happened in, to score our safety choices. We're then able to do a cost-benefit analysis of this to make ourselves... Again, this object is subjective mixed around all the time, sometimes, apologies. Um, to make ourselves as objective as possible. And really... This is a great piece of work for us because it takes away that pain and suffering of actually trying to understand and trying to fudge something into something. We actually get to be pragmatic. We can look at the value of a life and score and price that. We can, this sort of work we've done has also been taken to a national level and you can start looking at what we've created in our scoring to forecast expenditure. You can choose expenditure based on the safety benefits you will receive by doing it. It won't be just about sweating an asset, when, when's the last time we can actually spend some money. 
So this has been very good and a great learning for us. We then take it on to a slightly higher level and brought this safety justification into our whole life costing analysis. So for simple questions that were previously subjective, we are now becoming objective. So we've talked about track lowers to reduce clearances or bridge reconstructions to normal clearances. Each of them will have a safety scenario, something we can score. So we're able to bring that into the whole life cost model now. The real work, though, is understanding the actual capital cost. We need good estimators to actually, for these different options, we need to make sure we've got the right possession costs in there, the right material costs, the right access costs, the right stakeholder costs. If we're having to provide access over a field for a bridge reconstruction, making sure we're getting all these numbers together. For things like track lowers at reduced clearances, it changes our planned maintenance regime for the future. So we have to bring that into the, the life cycle. Also the performance. We're looking at performance that has occurred on the west coast or the east coast where we've had faults at reduced clearance bridges, how many minutes were lost, what's the value of that. At lesser clearances to bridges, we need to clean the insulators more, there's more planned maintenance. So the costs go up the less of the electrical clearances. And again, that little safety bit that I've talked about. What we're able to do then is bring that into a cumulative cash flow analysis that how much is that project costing us over 60 years. We use a fancy spreadsheet or system uh, that Milton Keynes colleagues have developed called Cobalt and that pumps us out a nice number. What we're then able to do this is put it in a nice coloured chart so project managers understand it <laughs> and we can make, uh, the engineers can then inform the business what is the right choice, what is the best choice for the business to make. I can't express how useful this has been for us. And just talking to Andy there, maybe it's something we can knowledge share over. I know Andy's got some challenging structures. So if anyone wants to talk about this, please contact me after the event. It's not a problem at all. But fortunately, or unfortunately, most of Great Western was built by Brunel. So when I go and meet Historic England and our plans, and I'm telling them about my fabulous whole life costing CSM, compensating method inspired, objective spreadsheet that says reconstruction of this bridge is the right thing to do, you can imagine the love in the room for me. <laughs> <laughs> and this leads me neatly into what Martin's going to talk about, which was the biggest track renewal possession ever undertaken by Network Rail. Now, listening to the Egypt guys, I know 95% of statistics are made up, so I'm sure they're going to have a chat with me at lunch. Um, but now I'd like to hand over to Martin. Thank you. For those people that know me, my name is Martin Veal. I'm a track engineer on GWEP. For those people that don't know me, it's still Martin Veal and I'm still working on GWEP. Right, um, thank you, Howard, for the introduction earlier. I'll pay you the money in a second. Yes, Brunel built these lovely structures, um, caused me a headache. He is my arch rival. <laughs> they get worse, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm the track engineer on GWEP. It sounded easy when I first joined. No, it's not. Um, I've done a lot of presentations to the public, so. It's interesting to do a presentation to my peers about how I'm going to level it. But essentially, when I sort of, sort of talk to the public, what do you talk about? How do you explain this kind of thing? Because they see it as electrification. And it's not electrification. It's much bigger than electrification and track rules. But with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> and that is a big responsibility. Because it is a multidiscipline project. And electrification is the end bit. We take it into account at the beginning but it's the bit that comes in at the end. And that's, that's a key thing to get across, especially to the general public. The civil engineers have piles. They have loads of piles. And it's important to take that into account when you go through the network. Nobody got a laugh off that, really? And um, you've got to take that into account with the drainage as well. So, you know, when you're sticking piles in the ground, there's drainage, there's other things in the ground that you've got to take into account. So there's trial pits and everything happening. Just to stick piles in the ground for the civils team, you've got... The signal engineers with immunisation, you've got EMP transforming the network. It's going to be a dead audience today, isn't it? And early knitting their way through the Victorian infrastructure at the very end. Now, where's track in that, I hear you ask? <laughs> or not? Um, <laughs> basically, blimmin' everywhere. Because they all want to know everything about track. Track is at the beginning and track is at the end.
breaking news. As you might or may or not know, IEP train has been suspended. There it is, <laughs> being loaded up on the train out of Japan. <laughs> Strangely, I got some odd emails after I sent that out to the project managers. Um, <laughs> it is on its way over, as Howard's already mentioned. Interestingly, I noticed that it's got its wheels nicked lately in North Pole Depot. There it is up on blocks. Very early days yet. You can't trust anyone. Um, but that's why we're doing it. And track's responsibility is first and last. So the early engineers at the beginning want to know where the track is. <coughs> All of it. Every single bit. They also want to know in detail about the S and C. So you're basically surveying the entire route. We had to look at a clever way of doing this, because you can't just send men out on the track for the entire thing. It costs a fortune. You'll never get access. So we ran out and we did a load of LiDAR work, which has its interesting challenges in its own right, because once you start discussing accuracy with LiDAR, you get statistics. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> So you've got to take everything with a pinch of salt and have a look at what you're actually getting through and the areas you're ascertaining. So we are actually manually surveying all the S&C units for the OLE. And you need to understand all the alignment information completely and all the structural information completely, either be it from the national gauging database or going out there manually and getting the files yourself. So you roughly know where it is, but you need to know where it's going to be as well. And it's not just us making that kind of call, it's maintenance, it's renewals. All of those people are doing things to the track constantly. You're working on a moving beast. As Howard says, it's practically open heart surgery. And a long-term asset, I've got a ram who looks at me and goes, by the way, you're doing all this fine work, you've got an alignment, can you pass it over to me at the end because I want to do a managed track position? Great. Yes, I'll have a look at that. Because theoretically, we've got all the information there, you just need to put it together and then pass it across at the end. And then you start having discussions about which grid to put it in, who's going to manage it, com constantly updating it with renewals work and maintenance work. It, it becomes a very, very large beast. And in terms of track lowers, because that's primarily where I, where I get stuck into it, to some of these things, it's everyone says it's just a track lower. You know what I mean. It's just a small track lower. Don't worry about it. They're all huge. Even the small ones, they're all huge. Uh, you can all read. It, the, you don't just dig the track up. The, 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 the conversations I'm having with, with the drainage engineers, the dams, um, they love being called that, by the way, drainage asset managers. You also get the assistant ones, Adam. It's great. Um, <laughs> you've got major issues with drainage. Formation is your key asset. Your formation goes, your track goes. OLA engineers in Series 1 is under development. So we get a moving target. We've done some option schemes a couple of times because they tweak <coughs> things. So we want an extra 50 mil from a track lower. Just an extra 50 mil off a track lower. You know where that goes. So we're constantly changing the beast and nailing things down has been a big, a big issue. And again, what Howard mentioned in terms of the stations. They put bridges next to stations. So you have, a, you have a risk there and you have a clashing of requirements in terms of the wire height to go under the bridge and the wire height at the station. Oh, and by the way, there's a level crossing next door as well. So you're, not, you're now looking at a 5.6 metre wire height potentially going towards a bridge into a station. And the track lower has got to take all that into account. So it's, it's a constantly moving beast and every time you stick a spade in the ground, you find a buried service. Don't discount the environmental side. Box tunnel was a major issue in terms of bats. Inside the tunnel and outside the tunnel. We've got newts, you've got badgers, you've got all the other things you need to look at. The environmental impact on that is a long-term asset and it's a long-term strategy to solve it. If you expect to get drainage consents within two weeks, you won't. It needs to be forward planned. One thing we are able to take into account, though, is that we've been working with the Toxin Fox at the access strategy of doing some of these <coughs> works. You're not just looking at individual track lowers. You're looking to combine some of them together, which has been great. So we can look at the efficiencies of scale and boxing it up. Looking at the long-term access strategy, so you're not going in just the once. We've got coordination of planning and constructability coming in from the construction side of it. You've got some complex S&C we've managed to put in as well. 
And we also had a bit of derived version reroute issue as well, which crept in out from the sideline. When it came round to it, we decided the best way to do all of this work was to combine it into a single blockade, otherwise known as a teapot. No, it wasn't. The lovely thing about acronyms is that people don't understand what they are when they start being used. So you hear this thing flying around and you think it's a teapot. And it's a teapod, temporary period of disruption. All right, it's not a blockade. So the first time you hear it, just as a side note, the first time you hear it, you say, what's a teapod? It's a blockade. But it's not a blockade. You're not allowed to call it a blockade. It's a teapot. So what is a teapot? It's a blockade. <laughs> <laughs> so I went around in the kitchen looking for teapots for a week. So we had teapot, temporary period of disruption, actually comes from interfacing with the public. Believe it or not, it's not something we've made up. Interfacing with the public from the comms team, it's a much better progression to the customer to say period of disruption rather than the blockade. Something else that corrupt out, goose eggs. I think it's because you have these sort of lines around each area. Now, I was going to make a big thing, and Howard mentioned it as well, about the six-week blockade when you've got a huge one up in Scotland. Um, but it's, it is a major job. And you have Box Tunnel was the primary thing that people focused on for the first few weeks. You then had Barthampton Junction and Sydney Gardens. And Dundas Viaduct crept in. Anyone know of Dundas Viaduct? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Little thing, we were going to get rid of it. It wasn't very important. <coughs> All right, for the electrification programme. So we thought, <coughs> brilliant, we'll try and get rid of that and get some extra trains in, de-risk it. That's the primary diversion route being used by the electrification team. So we had to put it back in again. And interestingly, that hadn't actually been fed back to some of the management team. We didn't actually know that Dundas Viaduct was important to the electrification team because it was being done by another project. <laughs> so that's why you need to keep interfacing with the people and the projects around you. So over six weeks, 217 trains in total, so they reckoned. And... Uh, yeah, interestingly, it went quite well. Box Tunnel. It's huge. You will have no problem, <laughs> said the civil engineer to the gauging engineer. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at this, actually quite a nice shot. You ought to see the, the um, cloud point scan, the laser scan that they did of the tunnel. It's like walking through it in the dark. But this is the sort of layout of the tunnel at the east going to the west. Massive porthole at the east end, and then you've got flying arches for the three locations all the way through. And in the middle, you've also got a shoulder of rock. But that's absolutely fine, because there's tons of ballast in box, and we all know that. Really, can you prove it? Well, no, we can't. So we have to go out and dig some trial pits. And we'll find some other stuff as well. By the way, there's a subway down there. How deep is it? Not quite sure. So we go out and dig some more trial pits. And the more you uncover, and the more you start to talk to the people around you, so we went down the MOD and had a chat with them as well, it is a very big subway and a siphon that links to some track drainage that goes through the middle as well. But nobody knew the details of this, so you're going in blind. And it turns out this is a lot shallower in the track than we expected. So we had to go and do a lot of work to fill this in before the track works. And it had to be done before the track works, and it had to be done in a closed environment, going back to bats. Because the MOD don't want bats, or more bats, going from the tunnel into their system. So the, the subway, as it was called, needed to be filled in, sorted, and ready for the track to come along and lift everything out from over the top. The only access was from the MOD, which was quite exciting for the people involved. And they had to get all the materials down a little, little alleyway from the eastern entrance. It needed to be done prior to the works, access restricted to the MOD, bats, bats, and more bats, and a hydrology report, because it was full of water. Everyone knew that that wouldn't be a problem if we filled it in. Can we prove that? No. So we had to go and prove it. And as it turns out, it, it links into Peter Gabriel's lake, just outside the east end, and the whole system goes through from Chippenham somewhere to that exit. And it is a case of where did you put the tunnel, uh, the drainage, in the tunnel. And again, where did you put it in the tunnel? Because everyone knows it's full of ballast and everyone knows there's a drainage system and it's really deep. Well, it wasn't. And there were different drainage systems in the tunnel 
and it wasn't a track drainage system, it was a three-track drainage system. And there's a little bit down here that came in from the MOD at 90,000 litres a minute. <laughs> Don't block that off. <laughs> so all these things were hidden, and we found them and we dealt with them. Aerodynamics report. Some bright spark popped up and said, Box Tunnel is the only 125 mile an hour tunnel in the country. Is that right? I think it is. All the rest are 110 because of aerodynamic risks. Is it not right? We'll pick on that later. But it was a risk because it was wide gauge. It wasn't standard 1976 foot, but to get the gauge we needed to bring the track in. We had to do an assessment for the aerodynamics. As it turns out, two trains passing each other in the tunnel, yes, there's a bit of a buffer going in and out the tunnel, <coughs> but the two trains passing each other, the impact on each train is exactly the same inside the tunnel as it is outside the tunnel. So if it doesn't work inside the tunnel, it doesn't work outside the tunnel either. If it doesn't work outside the tunnel, you can't have two trains passing. So we think it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got that one. <laughs> we were a bit tight for space, so we were using dynamic gauging. For those people that don't know about dynamic gauging, it is purely electrification and it looks at all the probabilities, shoves them down to look at each one that takes place at the same time, shuffles it around and looks at the probabilities and then gives you a result about how close you're going to be to the tunnel in terms of the electrification side of it. That's sort of a broad rough outline. And you need to get acceptance of that from the RAMs, both the track and the OLE RAMs. It monitors the end-of-life track position as well. So people are panicking when they see reduced clearance. Well, actually, that's the end of where the track ends up after the use of its track maintenance lift allowance, which you also have to look at separately against what you actually want and what you actually need in some of these scenarios, because you can't have everything. So the, the track engineer wants 100 mm track maintenance lift allowance. Your OLE engineer wants everything, if you ask, depending. And um, you can't have that in all these situations. So you end up with a custom alignment of where you put the wire and the track in the integration of such to get a wire height. And understanding where the horizontal wire positions is, the number of things that you can do with that wire is staggering. <laughs> God, I tried hard, honestly, guys. <laughs> Basically, you end up with a custom layout for each individual location, which has been proven to save about 150, 200 mils worth of, of dig in some instances. And Bathampton Junction, as we all know, a like-for-like -like renewal is a like-for-like -like renewal, right? <laughs> Especially in modern componentry. <laughs> Thankfully, it's the same componentry, but it is somewhere entirely different. Um, so when it came up to the renewals, and this is where we linked in with the renewals team and the OLE teams and the electrification teams as a whole in understanding what's needed long-term, what's needed for maintenance and renewals, etc. So the junction was being renewed, we could do it as part of electrification, it all got linked in together. But we had to move it because OLE don't want the junctions underneath the bridges. So we had to redesign it. <coughs> Few issues are off Bathampton Junction, let's not get over complex on the whole thing, it is just an S&C layout, but it is quite a complex one in its own right. There were some formation issues, there were some drainage issues, the OLE layout caused some problems, the track tied into an existing downturn out that couldn't be moved because of the existing layout going round the bends on the BHLs. We ended up putting in a twin split concrete bearer layout. The signalling team were coming through and putting axle counters in, so obviously we designed it with IBJs. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a bit harsh, but actually they, it was a good call for us because they didn't get through in time and the IBJs are being used at the moment. So that's where you've got to take into account the risks on each project about the one that's supposed to complete beforehand actually being able to achieve what they need to in that time. So there was a risk involved in that. We took the plunge. We've installed IRJs. We'll have to go back in the long term, but that was the best thing for the asset. It needed to be installed with split layouts because we didn't have the space to use any other method. And here's a few pictures of the uh, tilting wagons going in. Fascinating project, actually, to wander down and have a look at. And just for our Scottish guys, this is summer, <laughs> all right? <laughs> That's what it looks like, all right? <laughs> Hate to tell you. Um, it went in very well. It did actually go in very well. Very proud about that. And there's a little tamper hiding in the background there saying, look, I've just finished Send a Train through." So we had some good calls on that. Went in very well. Sydney Gardens was an interesting one because, I mean, it is just lowering a track. Let's not over-exaggerate things. It's just lowering a track. The issues come from the things that surround it. Sydney Gardens, it's just a retaining wall on a major canal that's four metres high. 
You can't touch it, you can't breathe on it, you can't mark it. And that's even the same for the wall on the other side. Can't breathe on it, can't touch it, don't sit on it, don't do anything with it. You're in the public eye, it's a very, very important wall. For all those people that saw the news, it was only on there a little bit, and that's good, because it went well. If it had gone badly, it would have been all over the top of it. Mm -hmm. So the good news is, you didn't see much of it on the news. Mm -hmm. All right, issue around Sydney Gardens, drainage. It's an existing drainage system. We know exactly the condition of the asset, so it's completely different to what we thought it was. We ended up leaving it where it was, and we had a load of drainage cat spits to renew, beautifully constructed, that we had to break down just to get the track in at that little bit lower. So, again, understanding your asset that's there, it's not just a track lower. Ongoing challenges for us. We've hit on stations before. We've got Keensham Station going in in April. You've got Oldfield Park going in the year after, and Bath Spa. We're rebuilding Bath Spa. It's the only time I'm ever going to admit that Structures has got something in charge of track. It's a listed structure. You ain't going to touch that without a fight. So track has to go in where we can get it in. Very unfortunate for us. And by the way, Howard, I've just had some recent news that we've just dug up the original drawings for Bath Station. It's got 100 mil of ballast underneath. Plenty. Lovely. <laughs> we only discovered this recently. Two minutes. Literally got two minutes. There's one of the trial pits that's telling us <laughs> how little ballast we've got. Um, yeah, it's proving a problem. Don't see Green Lane are going in very shortly as well. Again, just a track lower. Turns out the possessions aren't big enough to do the actual work because it seems to be a lot lower than we expected. We found a culvert. So that's proving a challenge. Lessons to learn. Big thing for us, access the topographical surveys, any kind of surveys, in fact. Trying to get them planned in early enough and finding the shelf life is running out before you actually use them. Specifi specifications need to be confirmed early. It's like trying to nail blancmange to a wall sometimes, but you need to get the specifications set to get your track lowers because the knock-on effect comes down to the people at the bottom in terms of constructability because the people that are installing it are trying to order trains a year in advance. So when you can't give them a design until from T minus four, they get a bit tetchy. So um, that's me running out. I think my time's just run out. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions, pop up in a minute. Thank you.